My wife, a native Navajo, invited me to go with her to her grandmother's house for Christmas. This being the first time I ever been to the Navajo Res, I wasn't sure what to expect. I have ideas about what it might be like. Nevertheless, I was excited to go somewhere I never been before. Most of my excitement came from wanting to learn more about the other culture and the unique opportunity of visiting a res as an outsider. Because of this, I was also a bit nervous. What if I wasn't accepted? Would the people be welcoming or would they feel a certain way about my presence? So we left our house on Christmas Eve with our dog and we started to make the four hour journey to grandma's house. On the way there, we saw a beautiful sunset scatter across the mountains. After traveling for about three hours, we found ourselves at the point that leads to an hour long drive on an isolated road that would eventually take us to our destination. While we were on this road, my wife shared stories of dances and the practices that her tribe has. All of it fascinated me and it actually left me asking more questions than I had imagined asking. By the time we arrived at grandma's house, it was dark and cold outside. As I began to unpack the car, my wife took our dog a bit away from the house so it could go use the bathroom. By the time she got back, I had taken our bags inside and locked the car up for the night. As we sat around the kitchen table eating food that was cooked by grandma, we shared stories and played a card game. After about an hour, we all said goodnight to one another and got ready to go to bed. At around midnight, my wife and I lay down and I called out to the dog to go to bed. A short time thereafter, we fell asleep. I forgot to turn off the light next to the bed on the nightstand. And around 2 or 3 a.m., I woke up having to use the bathroom. That's when I noticed that our dog was just sitting, looking at the door that led out to the small hallway. On the other side was the main door to the house. I called for her to come back to bed and she just put her nose at the base of the bedroom door, sniffing while scratching. So I assumed that she also had to go outside. I walked up to the main house door and opened it, ushering her to go outside. She ended up just sitting there and staring after trying to get her to go outside a few times and her not wanting to go. I closed the door and made my way to the kitchen to grab a glass of water. In the kitchen, there is a big window to the right of the sink that overlooks the driveway to the house with a bit of light that makes the driveway barely visible at night. As I put my hand to turn on the faucet, my head turned to the right to look outside. And that's when I saw it. A dog sitting outside and staring into the house. But there was something strange about this dog. It was much bigger than a typical large breed. By two times, I began to get the chills and internally said to myself, fuck this. Grabbing my water and about to head back to bed. That's when I saw that the dog stood up and began to walk away. One thing that I feel I might not convey well enough is the way this dog walked. It seemed to walk very awkward and almost stiff like. I mean what the fuck? What kind of dog even walks like that? First of all dogs don't even really walk. After making my way to bed, I couldn't help it but I was just thinking about that dog. As I laid in bed in silence, I began to hear faint, weird noises coming from the darkness beyond the bedroom window. I eventually fell asleep and woke up the next morning. As I sat in the kitchen table, eating the breakfast that grandma had gotten ready for us, I couldn't shake off the feeling of that strange encounter with the dog. Trying not to sound too alarmed, I simply asked if the neighbors had a large dog. But this question itself seemed to trigger a series of reactions from both grandma and my wife. She gave a worried look to my wife and they both exchanged glances. And without wasting much time, Grandma quickly stepped out of the kitchen and grabbed the old phone and began making phone calls to people that I assumed were members of their community. There was urgency in her voice 
and I could sense that something was going on. I didn't even say anything else no more, and they didn't say anything about it either. Soon after breakfast, a native priest and a medicine man arrived at the house. They also entered with some urgency and quickly began talking with grandma in whispering tones. My wife then joins my grandma in the conversation and they all began to look at me and talk more. Then the priest went around the house with sage and the medicine man comes to talk with me and grandma about my experience. I can see the priest draped in traditional clothing retrieving more bundles of sage from a pouch and also going outside around the house itself. To sum it up, I had encountered something. It was a presence and me, being an outsider, had somehow drawn its attention. My wife then said that she would be back and she eventually returned with a bundle of raw meat. It seemed that this raw meat was an offering, part of a ceremony to ward off this thing that I had encountered. At that moment, there was a ceremony held. I won't go too much into details because it's simply too much, but basically I encountered something that I shouldn't have the previous night. Nothing else happened after that. But now, whenever we visit grandma's house, I have learned to abide by the unspoken rules that have been shared with me over the years. And so I'm telling you all this story so you all can be careful if you ever go to the res. Abide by these rules even if you're not in the res. I refrain from getting up to go to the bathroom at night. And if by chance any of us happen to witness something strange that we should quickly speak up, not letting it linger in silence. And most of all, don't talk about these experiences with other people as you never know who is listening. The town I grew up in was a nice place to live. We had everything any normal town had. Fast food joints, the movies, supermarkets, and we even had two different shopping malls. You might think that two malls would be a bit too much for a small town, and you would be correct. The reason our town had two was that the original one was getting ready to close, while the new one had just been constructed. Everyone I talked to, all my friends and family, myself included, all loved them. While we didn't enjoy the huge amounts of people who would gather inside the shops, the mall would bring out a sense of wonder in all of us. The new mall had just been built earlier this year. It was massive. It had department stores that seemed to go on forever. The food court had almost 30 different restaurants. It even came complete with the movies and ice skating rink. Though the place was very cool, it was often bombarded by people from the neighboring towns and cities, congesting it beyond capacity. Taking a walk through that mall was like trying to walk in the ocean underwater with ankle weights. It got to the point where I would prefer going to the smaller, older mall which happened to be closer to my house. The older mall was constructed in the early 90s. It also had the movies, but it was a fraction of the size of the larger one. Actually, at this point in the mall's life, the only reason to go to this mall was the small arcade and to the movies. It often amused me to think that the large building was just that, a building for an arcade with a few game cabinets and the movies with only 8 rooms or so. Malls are great, but you'll never catch me inside one after the sun goes down. It was a midwinter's day when a couple of my friends asked me if I wanted to hang out. Me, being the outgoing kind of guy that I am, I agreed. After meeting up with the three of them, they asked me if we wanted to hang out for a bit, then catch a movie at the old mall. I nodded and we spent all day chilling since school had been out for a winter vacation. At around 5 p.m., we all made our way to the mall. The walking sucked, but since all of our parents worked and we didn't have cars of our own yet, it was really our only option. As we walked in, our feet went through a slurry of mud and ice. 
We joked and threw snowballs at one another the entire way there. We didn't arrive at the mall until 6.30 p.m., which wasn't an issue since our movie didn't start until 10 p.m. Walking inside the mall was like stepping inside of a rotting animal. Darkened shops littered the marble walkways. Only a few of them had their lights on, but it seemed like no one was around to maintain them. The further we walked, I noticed that they had built a sort of drywall type barrier to close off sections of the mall. Even though the sun was still out and it was setting fast, the closed sections of the mall were as black as night. The arcade itself wasn't impressive by any means, but it was nice to have something to do while we waited for our movie to start. All of us spent some time at the front row of cabinets and located games to play. I was finishing up a rather lengthy game when my friend tapped me on the shoulder, informing me about the movie. I looked down at my watch and was stunned to see that three hours had passed. Time truly does fly when you're mindlessly staring at a video game. So we made our way up the escalators towards the top level of the mall where the movie theater was and purchased our tickets. The movie was just some B-rated PG-13 horror flick, but one of our group was adamant about seeing it. When we entered the room, I wasn't surprised by how empty it was. Not only was it 10 p.m. at night, but the mall itself was pretty empty anyways. The only people we had seen while we were there was the guy behind the popcorn stand and some guy who sat in the back of the arcade staring at a computer screen. The movie ended up lasting around two hours and we weren't exiting the cinema until a little past midnight. I'm not sure why, but stepping from the theater room into the lobby was surreal. It was like I was in a place that I shouldn't be. The lobby lights were dim, and the concession stand was completely dark. One of my friends joked about going behind the counter and swiping some candy for the road, but I guess he felt guilty and he just continued walking along with us. Standing at the top of the escalators, we had a view of the entire mall. The previously illuminated shops were all dark now, and that once pitch black closed off area seemed almost like an endless void. At this point, the only sound we heard as we stood there was the clattering of the escalators as it cycled slowly. Once we were on the ground floor, we took a moment to scan around us, noting how we were most likely the only souls in the entire mall. As another one of our group suggested we go take a look around. At first, I didn't want to get in trouble, but I was eventually convinced into going along with words like, they'll just tell us to leave, and we can just say we got lost if they find us. We walked over towards one of the sections of drywall that was put up to separate the remaining shops from the closed down area. With a slight bit of effort, we managed to slide a section out of the way for us to step through. Stepping onto the other side of the wall was a strange feeling. Earlier when I felt like I shouldn't be there. This felt even more like danger to me. As if I went from standing on a cliff to walking on a tightrope. We began our walk through the abandoned part of the mall. Two of my friends using their phones as flashlights. The only sounds we could hear were the clattering of the escalators growing ever distant and our numerous footfalls as we pushed our way further into the darkness. We took note of the shops that had been completely gutted. Shelves and debris were scattered in and out of the shop fronts. Dismembered mannequin parts were all over the floor, both inside of the stores and outside. One of my friends picked up a mannequin hand and high-fived it before sending it flying further into the dark ahead of us. The sound it made echoed across the walls before quietly fading away. We all laughed to one another before a new sound forced us to stop. It sounded like the cracking of gravel or glass being stepped on. It was such a unique and distinct sound that we all froze in place, listening for a moment. Suddenly, a clatter sounded at my feet and we all yelled for a second my friend directed his phone's light towards the sound, and I stared in shock. It was the mannequin hand that he had just thrown out. Only the wrist of the hand looked cracked and warped, as if something had squeezed it before throwing it. My friend shined his light on me, 
but I was too busy staring at something else. It was my other friend's phone, sitting on the ground with a light shining directly upwards. I walked over to it and gently picked it up. When I did, I flashed it around me. The light danced on the dark before I saw something that almost made me vomit. It was my friend, but he was standing as stiff as a board. He wasn't facing me, but instead was looking up at something. I shifted the light slightly and I saw something, impossible, whatever it was. It towered above my friend easily over six feet tall. Its face was twisted. I couldn't really make out its features, but with the number of teeth I saw, I didn't really want to. Its torso was short, but its limbs were like a spider's. Its legs were long and narrow. Its arms were dangling at its side. It didn't seem to be wearing any clothes, but instead had gray skin with patches of black all over its body. I could feel my own body begin to seize when I saw the creature raise up a hand and rested it upon my friend's shoulders in front of him. He didn't even move as the creature touched him. He just stood there, silently. Just then, another one of my friends grabbed me by my shoulder and I spun around in panic almost knocking him down and dropping the phone. He told me we needed to leave right now as I scrambled to pick the phone back up. When I turned, I flashed the light back on the spot from before, but my friend and the creature had vanished. In a panic, we all ran out of there as fast as we could. The entire trek home, we talked about what we had seen and what we thought happened to our friend. One of my friends said that he had only seen him standing there. The other one said that he could only see me in the dark holding the flashlight. And then I told him what I had seen. And if they had not been there, they most likely wouldn't have believed me. We all debated on what we should do. If we should tell our parents or just pretend like it never happened. They were both in favor of acting like it never happened. But I couldn't just let one of my friends get hurt and not do anything about it. So about an hour after we got home, I made my way over to my friend's house, the one who was left behind. I knocked on his door and his mom answered. I told her that I really needed to tell her something important. But just before I could find any word, I saw him, my friend, sitting at their dinner table staring at the ground. I then asked if I could talk to him, but she said that he had only gotten home a few minutes ago and that he wasn't feeling very well. I returned his phone while I was standing there and then I went home. I haven't talked to or even seen my friend over the next two weeks when suddenly I was passing by and there was a for sale sign in their front yard and also a sold sticker plastered across the sign itself. I'm not sure what happened with my friend or why his family moved. I'm not sure who or what that creature was, but I don't think I will ever go to a mall after dark again. And I would advise you all to do the same. Going on a hike can be very therapeutic and it's also a great exercise. At least that's what my ex-girlfriend said when she first took me hiking. It started out as just some way for us to stay in shape and spend some time together. The first time we went, I was a skeptic. I'm no stranger to exercise, but climbing up a mountain wasn't something I would consider relaxing. I remember wheezing and struggling the entire trek up the mountain. I wanted nothing more than to just go home and just lay on the couch with a bag of chips. Once we had reached the summit, I'll tell you, there are only a very few sites that can match it. During our relationship, she and I would go hiking about twice a month. We always went to the same exact spot and hiked up the same exact trail. After a few months had passed, I was no longer wheezing and was able to truly appreciate the beauty of it. I actually never really knew how incredible nature actually was. After some time, our relationship started to go downhill. We had grown apart, and it seemed like every time we speak to one another, it would end up in a screaming match. Eventually, 
It became one fight too many, and we ended up breaking up. I'll be honest, it was rough for me those first couple of weeks. The realization didn't fully hit me until I was stepping out of my car and onto that dirt trail. It had become such a habit that I didn't even realize I was alone. Since I had already made the drive up to the mountain, I figured that I might as well go. The first hike, doing it alone, was heartbreaking. But surprisingly, she was right. It did end up being quite therapeutic for me. Making it all the way to the top on my own, I felt empowered and decided that I wanted to continue hiking regardless. So for the last two years, I gone hiking twice a month, on the same trail, on the same mountain. I did, however, change the days that I would go, just in case she still continued to hike up there as well. I didn't want to deal with the awkwardness of seeing her on the trail. However, yesterday was the last time I will ever go hiking in my life. The day started out as any other. I woke up, got ready, grabbed my pack, and drove up to the mountain. It had been raining all week prior, so I made sure to bring along a sturdy pair of boots, just in case, you know. When I arrived, I stared at the swinging sign on the metal chain. It read, Rock Slide. The trail is closed. I huffed and got back into my car. I thought about going home, and in hindsight, I should have done just that. But instead, I was adamant about maintaining my routine. I drove around to the other side of the mountain, which didn't take me very long. It wasn't that big of a mountain. I found a spot that appeared to be a clearing of some kind. It looked like an area for hikers to disembark and make their way up the mountain. As I pulled up, I saw a dirt trail leading through the trees, even though it was much more overgrown than the other path. I looked around and saw that this one had no sign, so I figured that the rock slide happened on the other side of the mountain. I grinned, inhaled deeply, and began my hike. This path was much more difficult than the other. It took me nearly twice as long to make it halfway up than it did on the other path. I ducked under branches, pushed between trees, and climbed over boulders. I was beginning to wonder if this was actually worth it when suddenly, I stepped out into a clearing. It seemed like a little pocket of nature safely preserved by the towering trees around it. There was a small stream lined with flowers running through it, with some deer scampering off in the distance. I felt some renewed energy pour into me as I continued onward. After two more hours of walking, I finally broke through the foliage and arrived at the top. As I stood up there, catching my air for a few moments, I looked around and enjoyed the view. I had never been on this side of the mountain before, so I wonder if I could see anything different. It didn't take me very long to notice a small cabin about halfway down the mountain, not too far from where I hiked actually. I wonder who could be living isolated up here on the mountain. As I stared at it from high above, I thought I saw something move in the trees near it. I stared a few moments longer to see if I could see it again, but there was no more movement. Then, a group of birds flew out from the surrounding trees, and I thought that must have been what I had seen earlier, just a bird. However, my curiosity wasn't fully satisfied, so I decided that upon my descent, I would try to pass by that cabin. Getting to it was much more difficult than heading back down the way I came. It was almost like the trees were blocking my attempts to get any closer. After nearly an hour of pushing my way through the brush that was in the way, I stepped down into where the cabin rested. The very first thing I noticed about it was that it appeared to be abandoned. The window seemed to have been shattered long ago. The wood was slowly rotting away in places. The wooden front door seemed to sway and knock off the door frame, almost like a wind chime. This was obviously some hunter's cabin from long ago that had been neglected for many years. The sun was nearly behind the mountain as I stepped onto the wooden steps. My heavy boots making the wood below my feet creak painfully despite its age. 
I admire the carefully carved wood as I walked up to the door. I reached down and gently pulled the door open. It only let out a soft squeak of the hinge before opening fully. I peered inside, and even though it was starting to become dark outside, I could still see the interior clearly. The door opened up into a living area with racks and shelves and a small couch. I walked inside, taking care not to step on any rotting wood. To my left was the door that seemed to open to a small washroom and kitchen area, with just a passing glance that appeared to be empty. I walked down the short hallway, and there were two doors, both on my left and right. I opened the one on my right first. It was a bedroom. The bed had long since been overtaken by fungus and random plant life. I backed out of the room and pushed open the door on my left. I walked inside, and nothing appeared to be out of the ordinary. That was until I saw something peeking out from behind the desk. It looked like a boot. Making my way around it, my pace slowly came to a stop. I think I had found the owner of the cabin. It was a man. Or at least I think it was due to the clothing. Because the skeleton still made it difficult to tell. The clothes seemed to have been torn up. Most likely due to wild animals. I thought I wonder if the person had a heart attack or some sort of accident. I then thought about how terrible... It must have been to have died up here all alone. Just then, I heard a noise that sounded like the front door swinging shut. I felt my body freeze in place. I waited and listened for a minute or two. After not hearing anything, I thought it must have just been the wind blowing the door shut. I started to hear the floor creak. Somebody was in the cabin with me. I quietly backed up behind where the sturdy door opened up and pressed my back flat against it. A voice, like a ragged whisper, drifted down the hall. Hello. It sounded like an old man. I'm not sure why, but I stayed quiet and waited. Another voice, but this time it was loud. Who's out there? When I heard them say this, it sounded strange. It didn't seem like the correct way to ask if someone was inside the cabin. Just as I had this thought, the door on my left began to move slightly. It opened up, but I was still behind it. So the door just gently rested against me. I could still see around the frame, however. And whatever had opened the door was crawling on the ground. My eyes grew wide with each passing second. Its gray skin and this form figure were unlike anything I had seen before. Long fingers with sharp nails quietly pressed into the wood in front of it. Disjointed feet pushed the rest of the body along. I remember thinking it sort of looked like that creature from the Lord of the Rings or maybe a hairless dog. It crawled around slowly before climbing up onto the desk in the room and looked down at the skeleton. Then, that same voice sounded. Who's out there? I realized at that moment that the voice was coming from this thing. Just then, my body weight shifted in the floor beneath my feet and the wood creaked. This thing snapped its head to me its face with two gray eyes and a mouth like a cavern of teeth below. Then, it reared back and unleashed a deafening shriek at me. I quickly swung around the door slamming it shut behind me. I dashed out of the cabin nearly falling onto my face off the porch. My quick breathing was doing nothing to calm my panicked state as I forced my way through the trees and over the rocks. I didn't know exactly where I was going, I just knew it was down the mountain. My lungs were starting to sting in my chest, but I kept my pace up as long as I could. After nearly an hour of running, my foot slipped on a slick rock, and I fell over through brush and trees. I could feel scrapes and scratches forming on my face, as well as bruises beginning to form on my body. I came to a rest in the mud and nearly fainted. My eyes shot open a moment later, as I heard a rustling of bushes. I scrambled back up and continued moving down the mountain, now with more of a limp. 
After nearly 10 more minutes of limping down the mountain, I exited the trees, not too far from where I had parked my car. Seeing this gave me hope I had never felt before. As I approached, I began to feel my injuries more and more. I quickly got inside my car and safely drove home. I've been laying on this couch with ice packs ever since I got home. I gave my ex a phone call this morning and I asked her if she still hiked up on that mountain. She told me that she did and I told her exactly what I'm about to tell all of you right now. If you ever feel like going camping or hiking up a mountain alone, don't. There's something living up there in the mountains, in those woods, something terrifying and it's something you don't ever want to see for yourself. I've been living in the southwest for my entire life and I'll be the first to tell you that there isn't much going on here. Even though I assume that could be said for pretty much anywhere that isn't Disneyland. To be honest, there's only two guarantees living in the southwest. The scorching heat and the rocks. I remember my mom taking me over to the Grand Canyon when I was little and I couldn't help but think, this is it. I wasn't excited like your average kid, but my point was still valid. It was just rocky formations and the sun bearing down overhead. Once the initial feeling of viewing the canyon went away, I just couldn't wait to get back home. Growing up, I found comfort in my friendships. While the town and landscape offer little in the way of entertainment, the friends I had made over the years made up for it. We would spend our summers riding our bikes through the various side streets and circling all the blocks. We would just be outside convenience stores on hot days. The years slipped by so quick, and before I knew it, I was sitting in a lecture hall, listening to the professor just rattle on. The college life wasn't what I had imagined. Growing up, I had heard all these stories from adults about the good times they had in college. It seemed to be far more work than play. All of my professors were demanding and my off hours were filled with whatever part-time job I could find at the time. Lucky for me, it wasn't all that bad. One of my closest friends, Drew, had gone to the same college with me. We had most classes together, so that made it a little bit more exciting. Drew was one of the first people I had met growing up. He had moved to the neighborhood roughly a year before we began school together. We became fast friends, which could be perceived as quite strange from the outside. Drew was extremely outgoing, the type of person to always be the center of attention. Meanwhile, let's just say that I was less approachable. Looking back, I guess it's quite humorous to think about. He was very popular in school, but instead of hanging out with the plastic clique, as I called them, he would choose to hang around with me. Eventually, our group of friends grew over the years. Alan, Mikey, Logan, Nate and Riley and with Drew and me added into the mix that made seven of us. However, by the time we all graduated high school, only three of us lived in town. Drew and I both got accepted into the same college just outside of town, while Nate had gotten a pretty steady job working at a warehouse. Even though that seemed to take up all his time, the others moved out of town or out of the state. The end of college was quickly approaching, and during lunch one day, Drew mentioned to me that he had a job lined up for him out of state. As much as it hurt to hear, I understood and was happy for him. That of course forced me to think about my plans after college, and I quickly realized I didn't have many aspirations. I think Drew could tell by my expression that the news was somewhat heavy for me, but he assured me that everything would be fine. I ended up just returning a shrug. Before we returned to our classes, he mentioned that he was working on something that would make me much happier. My curiosity lit up as I wondered what he could mean by working on something. As the days and weeks passed, I had completely forgotten about this conversation. Until about a week after graduation, Drew messaged me and asked if I was available for an upcoming weekend. I checked my calendar and I told him I was, but of course I inquired as to what it was about. He said he wanted to go camping, 
We had never gone camping before, and Drew didn't really strike me as the outdoors type. He pleaded with me that this would be really fun, and despite having a couple of reservations about it, I agreed. I made note of the weekend that marked it on my calendar. I bought what I imagined to be enough provisions for a day or two and waited for Drew to pick me up. He arrived late in the morning on Friday and I hopped into his car. He flashed a grin that seemed to him like he was hiding something. I asked him what was up, but he just shook his head. We drove out of the town for a few miles before turning off onto a dirt road. The road began to go up the side of a rock formation and we arrived at the peak of this hill. I noticed this large, flat clearing. These small mesas are not uncommon, but I was surprised that this was going to be our destination. As we rode to a stop, I noticed a few other cars in the vicinity. I immediately recognized the people standing next to them. Alan, Mikey, Riley, Logan, and Nate. Two of them were busy setting up tents while another was busy getting the fire started. I chuckled and shook my head. Drew briefly patted me on the shoulder before we both topped out. Everyone was in great spirits, and we spent most of the day remembering about the past. We got the campsite all set up, and I began soaking everything in around the edges of the hilltop. My feelings towards this rocky terrain was much different than when I was younger. As I stood there attempting to soak in my surroundings, I noticed something off in the distance. A large dark shape was moving slowly down the hill. I tried to focus my eyes by squinting, but it wasn't helping. Nate then patted me on the shoulder and asked me if I wanted a beer, showing the still semi full can in my hand towards him. He nodded and began to walk away when I called him back over. I asked him to check out this weird shape on the other hill, and he stood there briefly scanning the terrain. He told me he couldn't see anything and I began looking in the same area that I had last spotted it. Sure enough, the shape I had seen was gone. I shrugged, telling him it was most likely a wild animal or something. He gave me a weird look. I knew he was implying that I was drunk, but then he laughed and walked off. As I stood there, I couldn't stop thinking about that weird shape. In contrast to the terrain around it, it was quite large, and it seemed to crawl along the rocks. I had never seen an animal move like that before, so my brain was hyper focused on whatever it was. I eventually pulled myself away from the cliff's edge and returned to the camp. We ate various foods we had brought along with us and put a sizable dent into the alcoholic drinks we had brought. It wasn't long until we all retired to our tents for the night. At some point during the night, I was awoken to an odd sound. It sounded like someone was digging in the dirt outside of my tent. When I first heard this, my body initially ceased up. There would be a long scrape in the dirt, followed by a stop, and then another long scrape. I thought maybe one of the guys couldn't sleep well and was just walking around outside, killing time. When I heard something new, something which sent a wave of uneasiness coursing through my veins, something was breathing next to my tent. It was inhaling sharply and allowed a very quiet laugh. The laughing is what creeped me out, only because it sounded very artificial, like it was almost mimicking a laugh. The scraping then resumed before fading off in the distance, and the sounds of nature once again filled the night air. I laid awake in my tent for a few hours before falling asleep. I then woke up to Drew patting me on the leg. I shot up in panic, nearly striking him in the process. He went backwards with his hands up, and I caught my breath and apologized to him. He then asked if I could come outside and take a look at something. I stepped out from my tent and saw everyone standing around looking at the ground. I turned and saw large scrapes in the dirt around my tent before they trailed off towards the cliff. I could feel that familiar panic rising in my chest when suddenly I heard that fake laughing again, which nearly caused me to jump out of my skin. I spun around and saw Nate with a wide smile on his face. Then, all at the same time, everyone around erupted in laughing. My fear quickly turned to madness, then subsided 
and was replaced with acceptance. Mikey then appeared from behind my tent with a towel in his hand as he wiped the tears away from his eyes. After the laughing died down, Nate apologized and said he couldn't help himself. I nodded to him and accepted the joke. Honestly, it was a pretty good one. We all got back to hanging out and enjoying the day. As we sat around in our chairs, talking, the conversation circled back to the prank and Nate asked what I thought was on the other hill. I attempted to brush them off, but they insisted. I described to them the shape and they all tried to take a guess on what it was. Some of the ideas thrown around were coyotes or jaguars and Mikey suggested it was most likely just a really big snake to which we all started laughing. Later in the evening, after we all had a bite to eat, we were just about to bed down for the night when a piercing scream drew our attention. We all turned and saw Riley running towards us from the edge of the cliff in a state of panic. He managed to say he saw something over the edge of the cliff. His white eyes darted to each of us, looking for acceptance when everyone, including myself, busted out laughing. Half of the group turned to me chuckling and I told Riley that it was a good attempt, but it wouldn't work a second time. He then walked over to me and grabbed me by the shirt collar. He shouted at me that he wasn't joking and I threw my hands up, attempting to push him off. When he suddenly released me, I brushed my shirt down, asking him what his problem was. When I looked back up at him, I noticed that he was no longer looking at me, but instead was looking at something past me. Everyone else became silent as they all stared in my direction as well. Slowly, I turned and saw what everyone else was looking at. There was a face just on the edge of the campfire light. It looked almost like a porcelain doll. I couldn't make out the rest of its body. I took a step backward and looked out of the corner of my eye just to make sure everyone in our group was here and that this wasn't just another prank. Everyone was right beside me and I noticed that Nate looked more shaken than the rest of us. I turned back and saw a single hand appear into the light as it got closer to us. The arm was thin but was nearly the size of its body. Its hand was pressing deeply into the dirt with these fingers that came to a fine point. The fingers didn't appear rigid. They almost reminded me of the Grinch's fingers, which for some reason made me shudder. Even worse, another hand appeared and it looked as if it was pulling its body behind it. As more and more of it came into the light, I watched this long, almost insect-like body I did take note of something right away. As I was watching this happen, I couldn't hear a single sound from this creature. No shuffling of dirt. No fake laughing sounds. It was silent. Then I felt something touch my shoulder, trying desperately not to scream. I looked and it was Drew. He whispered in a shaky voice that he wanted to run to the cars. I was only able to return a slight nod. Drew and I were just about to make a run for it when Logan, someone who is always quiet, screamed and began sprinting away. The creature's head then snapped to face him and still without a sound, it darted back into the darkness and all we saw was a large shadow blur heading towards his direction. Logan's screams were cut off and I watched the streak of red shoot out towards us from the darkness droplets of blood impacted the campfire a second later logan came flying into the light and hit the ground hard he was gripping his leg which had these massive cuts carved into it we all scrambled to pick him up and we dashed towards our vehicles we threw him in the back and drove down the hill back towards town and we didn't stop until we were at the hospital we quickly carried him inside as the nurses and doctors took over from there Drew and I looked down at our blood-stained hands and walked over to sit with the others. Drew was the only one of us who could somehow speak clearly. 
and he told the doctor that Logan had slipped off the edge of where we were camping and that we were able to pull him back up but he messed up his leg on some sharp rocks in the process. We were in the waiting room for a few hours until the doctor arrived and told us that he was going to be fine. He said his leg looked much worse than it actually was, which we all exhaled a sigh of relief. Just before the doctor departed, he turned and asked us again to confirm that the cause of this were rocks, and we all shakily nodded our heads at him. We thought he was going to press further, but he just nodded to his clipboard, returned a faint smile, and made a passing remark about him being lucky it was just his leg and not his head. Logan was released from the hospital after five days, and we all showed up to see him off home. He barely said two words to us the entire time. After that, one by one, everyone else went back to live in their life, not even wanting to talk about that night. And just as Drew was getting his things in order, I asked him if his company was hiring. He stopped and flashed a faint, creepy smile which upon seeing my expression quickly shifted into a look of concern before telling me yes they are day one I hit a deer on my way to work it's actually very common where I live it's an area that's filled with woods with trees lining the road that are just perfect for concealing a deer until the moment it leaps in front of your vehicle. Apparently, at least two are hit and killed each day. My cousin and grandparents have all done it, quite a few times actually. So I guess it was a matter of time before I did. I was already running a few minutes late, putting off leaving as much as I dared. I opened the garage and stared at the black tree silhouetted. Wow, I slipped on my shoes. It's spooky, waking up at 5 a.m. to a pitch black world. I reversed the car, turning as I backed up to make a turn in my driveway. I didn't even bother to look back, cause obviously there's nothing ever there. On top of that, I know my own driveway. Well, I thought I did. I cussed and braked. That was either the low stone wall in front of the garden or something else, most likely a deer. I pumped the brake lights and looked through the back window. Nothing. I was already a few minutes late and figured I would either come home to a deer in my driveway or some damage on the house, and I drove off. I came home to none of those things. On the plus side, the car was fine. Day 7 I saw a deer today on my afternoon jog. I work the early morning shift, but have the afternoons off, and I make a genuine effort to exercise daily, no matter how tired or drained I feel. I often see deer hanging out in people's yards or the woods, so it wasn't an unusual sight. What was strange was the injury on her back right leg. It looked broken, with dry blood coating her side. I felt a stab of pity, but the way she was watching me made me more uneasy. She didn't flinch, stood like stone and stared. Despite the heat of my run, my skin was cold. At the end of the block, I glanced back to put my stomach at ease, and I saw nothing. Just a neighbor standing over the garden bed, staring back at me. Day 12. I've been seeing deer on every run I take. Every morning on my long drive through the middle of nowhere to get to work, my brights catch them on the side of the road. I think that's normal. They don't have any natural predators, unless you count cars. I haven't seen my bloody friend since last week, and I'm assuming she's most likely dead. These deer, though, the way they watch me makes my skin crawl. I refuse to let it get to me. Fortunately, I can blast my music and run faster. Anyways, whenever I see deer and check again, the deer is gone. Most likely scared off by the appearance of a neighbor or two who's shown up. 
they would help if anything happened. Day 13. Yeah, fuck what I wrote the other day. I know deer are night creatures, but that cannot explain what I saw this morning. I opened the garage. On the edge of light cast by my garage was a mass of deer standing and moving silently in my yard. I jumped for my car and sped the hell out of my driveway. They didn't run in front of me, but they just watched. My hands were slipping on the wheel throughout my drive and my heart continued to pound at work and it wasn't the caffeine. As a matter of fact, I have stopped running after work. Day 17. I'm so embarrassed right now. I'm in tears. Since yesterday morning, I've been staying inside the house as much as possible. I was looking out my front window this evening, considering how quickly I can get in my car and through the driveway, when I saw the massive deer again. Only this time, and I know what I saw, there were about three people standing with them. I called 911 and told them what I saw out front. Three police cars, apparently having nothing better to do, showed up but the people and deer were gone within seconds of me calling. Typical, I spent over an hour with the police. I made it seem like this was the first time I had seen deer act like this. No, I didn't recognize anyone. And no, I didn't want to talk with anyone. I saw the people trespassing and freaked out. The police finally seemed to buy that, and they backed off. Day 19 I'm not sure what's going to happen next. But please, I beg you, if you ever hit a deer on the road, or come across a deer that has been hit on the road, get out the vehicle and help it. Because who knows, one of its friends might be watching you. And if you have hit a deer before, just look out your window tonight. And don't be shocked if you see somebody or something staring back at you. I was supposed to leave for work 30 minutes ago. It's pitch black outside, but I can just make out their inky forms in the woods, circling the light coming from my window. They're moving closer and closer. No one will believe me. I can't prove anything. All that I do know is there's one woman staring directly at my window who's come closer than the others have dared. A woman with a limp and dirty, matted jeans. I went to high school in Arizona and we had lots of Navajo students. One of them who told me about her grandma. She said that when her grandma was young, her family thought there was a skinwalker stalking their home. I'm not sure what caused them to be suspicious, but they were examining all of the animals. They said that even though a skinwalker can assume any animal form, their eyes still stay human looking. And what's more, because they have human ears underneath the animal's skin. They can't move their ears. So this girl's grandma was going around and tapping all the ears of the goats to make sure they could twitch them. She came to one goat and gave the ears a flap and they just stayed limp. She then said that she looked right into the eyes of the goat and two human eyes were looking back at her. She said that's when the skinwalker charged into her and knocked her over before running off. She said they never saw it again. After that, I have never looked at goats the same way again. Or any kind of livestock in general. As a matter of fact, you should probably look into the eyes of any pets that you own or any livestock before going to sleep tonight. One of them might just be a skinwalker. A woman living in White River, Arizona, comes home late at night.
from running an errand. She pulls up her driveway, gets out of the vehicle, and using her keychain, opens the garage door. Just as it's going up, she hears something run up at her back. As she turns, she sees this dark shadowy figure slip in behind her husband's truck, which is in the driveway and to her left. The only thing that she sees is that it has patches of short, scraggly hair. And the feet that she saw don't look like they belong to anything that's human. She runs into the garage and into the house, screaming for her husband. He comes out the house and checks all around, but he finds nothing. He does tease her a bit and tells her that she shouldn't let her imagination get the better of her. However, only minutes later, a friend who the husband is expecting arrives. He's all excited and somewhat upset. He explains that as he was coming towards the house, some two-legged creature, he says it looked like a skinny bear, only really scraggly and skinny with its mouth and teeth exposed, almost like it was drunk. It came stumbling out of the trees and straight into the side of his SUV. He slammed on his brakes but when he got out to look, there was nothing on the road or off to the shoulder. The two then go out to have a look at the SUV. And sure enough, there's a small dent and some black hair stuck to the rear fender on the driver's side and some hair in the bumper. But there's no blood. My older sister, who is Irish, Italian, recently got married, not her first, to this guy who is Navajo. Shortly after they settled down together, she has a boy from her first marriage. They invite me to hang out with them down on the reservation, where her new husband has a house and some property. I ended up bringing a few friends. Being a white guy, I know nothing about native or skinwalker lore. One of the friends that comes along, Gregory, however, is into horror and demons, things like that, and knows all these different werewolf, vampire, and even skinwalker stories. That first night, with not much else to do, we are out in the middle of a few hundred thousand acres of hills and wooded land. We end up sitting around a small bonfire with him telling us one story after the next. The next day we all take a walk to the elementary school to bring my nephew home. My sister usually picks him up but she has some errands to run. Along the way we pass this scraggly looking dude sitting beneath this tree beside the road. He looks kind of old but in a way that is difficult to say just how old. Regardless, it's definitely creepy the way he's watching us. His eyes kind of flat and dull, as if unaffected by the sunlight. As we make our way back from the school, my nephew seems pretty quiet and shy. When he sees this guy, he ducks behind me and starts tugging on my shirt. I ask him what's up, and without taking his eyes off the guy, he whispers, I don't like that man, he's bad. The way he said it gives me chills. But I really don't think all that much more about it. Well that night, Gregory and my other two friends, Jeff and Sarah and I, all head out to go check out this abandoned part of the reservation, which supposedly is haunted. We had been warned not to buy my brother-in-law he says it is an inhabited place of ghosts of the past and some kind of dark being. Of course, that only serves to make us want to go even more. So we dismiss his warnings and ghost stories, take the keys to my sister's SUV, and off we go. When we first get there, I have to admit, it is a lot spookier looking and feeling than any one of us had expected consisting of only a handful of abandoned structures 
most of the faded and grain wood, and the biggest of which is only two stories. It looks to me to have been some sort of mining town, like the kind that you see on westerns on TV. Anyways, just about every window is completely busted out, with only a share of the pointed pane hanging here and there. There isn't a single door still in place, and definitely not an item of any value anywhere to be seen. In fact, there isn't much of anything at all. As we walk around, going up to and looking into some of the places, but not entering, Jeff takes us to telling us how this reminds him of one of his past flings with some girl. Sarah and I roll our eyes, as we always do when he starts waxing old memories and then goes off a little ways, leaving him and Gregory together. We find a cozy corner out of sight and start getting comfortable, if you know what I mean. We are going at it for all five seconds when we both notice it has suddenly turned chill. Just as we huddle together for warmness, we hear a blood crawling scream. We jump up and run back into the direction of the SUV and where we last saw Gregory and Jeff. There, they are facing the remains of the storefront, their eyes staring straight ahead and oblivious to the fact that we are there. Sarah and I both look to where they are staring and we see this creature that it is a wolf-like creature but yet not being a wolf completely. I'm still not sure to this day if it was real or not. Either way, I for one am scared as I have never been in my life. Its body is fully covered in hair and it had these long wraith-like fingers which end in thick curled nails definitely claw-like. Its head is the worst though. Its eyes are just these two chunks of dark coal, flat and emotionless. Its mouth is full of small daggers. I'm not sure how long we stand there frozen. Finally, it takes a step forward and as if released from some spell, we bolt to the truck. Jeff and I jump into the front seat, he to the driver's side and me and the passenger. While Gregory and Sarah go for the back, Jeff doesn't have his license, but at that point no one's arguing. The keys are in the ignition. He starts the SUV, floors the gas, and we speed off gravel and sand flying everywhere. I look out the window on my side, and then all around, I see nothing through the cloud of dust and the darkening twilight. When I turn to look back at Gregory, the only thing he could think to say is, you got some lipstick on your chin. Just down the road some, Jeff slows the truck. By this time we are all laughing and making fun of each other for running away from shadows. Just then, a look of fright comes over Sarah's face. And without saying a word, she points a trembling finger out towards the trees along the side of the road. There back in the dark of the trees is where we see the shadow-like figure running just inside the tree line as if it's keeping pace with us and we all yell in unison to Jeff and he again presses down on the gas the SUV spring into life but that thing whatever it is stays with us every inch of the way it is only when we see the lights to my sister's porch that making the turn off to her when we pull up to the house, my brother-in-law is out on the porch with this guy dressed in a long sleeve button white shirt, blue jeans, and work boots. He later introduces himself as the local shaman. When we get up to the porch, the guy is in the middle of some kind of blessing. When he finishes, my brother-in-law simply turns to us and says, Now you know maybe next time you'll listen. Later, after the shaman leaves, he admonishes us, saying that by telling the skinwalker stories, we put everyone out there in danger. He said just mentioning them can make them come and seek you out.
For years, I was the guy you would call if you had a squirrel in your attic. I mean, to a lot of people, I'm still that guy. But over the last 20 years, I have branched out to other less common infestations. Now, I'm the guy you call if there is a haunted doll going through your attic or a Sasquatch trampling your flower beds. I actually love my job. All the skills I have acquired have allowed me to travel across the country. I have met incredible people and I have experienced cryptids like few have ever done before. It doesn't hurt that the pay is great, but the stories are even better. I have one short story for you now. It's more of a public service announcement than anything else really. I have dealt with every sort of infestation from Sasquatches. You spray human urine around the area of sighting and it will avoid the area. A demonic presence. You need to bring in a priest. Sometimes it can be tricked into inhabiting a lesser creature, like a frog. And jackalopes. It's just a bunny with some antlers. Put it in a cage and give the poor thing a carrot. But recently, there has been one cryptid that has been growing more and more invasive into human settlements. It's called the Hide Behind. Most commonly found in the forests of the North United States and Canada, the Hide Behind is one cryptid that cannot easily be dealt with. In fact, I'm not sure it's even possible for one of these to be bagged and tagged like we normally would with other creatures. To my knowledge, no hide behind has ever been killed, maimed, dazed, or even simply removed from a residence. Once it has made a claim to an area, whether it be a local forest, a cave, or even, in one specific bloody case, a bass pro shop, it will actually defend that area to the death. It was first documented by the Native Americans, then by the lumberjacks in the PNW of America. The hide behind is one of the lesser known but cryptids on the continent, but without a doubt, one of the most dangerous. No one really knows what they actually look like, as the name suggests. As soon as they are seen, they quickly duck out of view to hide behind anything in the vicinity. Out in the wild, this would be trees and rocks. In your home, this could be a corner, a kitchen cabinet, a TV, or literally anything else they can manipulate their body to hide behind an object of any size. In the few accounts of the sightings we have on record, they have been described as everything from a large bear, lion hybrid, to a frail and elderly woman with long arms and rashes on her skin. Because of this wide discrepancy in their descriptions, they are believed to be shapeshifters that can change their shape based on what they believe will best get their potential victim to come closer and investigate the sighting. I don't know why the hide behinds are moving into suburbs. I guess destruction of their natural habitat, but it is becoming a real problem. That's why I'm going to share the story with you now, so you know what to do if one ever shows up in your home. I pulled up to Tim's house around 12 p.m. on a Tuesday. He had called in to tell us there was a demonic entity in his house. He wanted us to remove it ASAP. They always demand ASAP. Tim had nothing going on, but people are just so much more demanding now than they were 20 years ago. I took a quick look around the house and it was pretty apparent there wasn't any sort of demon in his residence. Not only was there no reaction to the holy water and Ouija board I had brought with me, but Tim also didn't have normal symptoms of a demon haunting him, bad dreams, sleep paralysis, or the witnessing of any telekinetic events. After further questioning, 
He described what he had seen in more detail. He said, First, I was sitting right there on the couch watching TV when I got the feeling I was being watched. I turned my attention to the screen door and for just a second, I saw a bear looking in through the screen. But it wasn't a bear, you see. A bear would have just kept on staring at me or keep poking at the door. But this thing just ducked out of view as quick as can be. Like it was trying to sneak up on me and I had caught it in the act. But I just grabbed my gun, set it on my lap and kept on watching the TV. And eventually that feeling like I was being watched just kind of melted off. It was all peaches and cream until she showed up a few days later. This she that Tim was referring to was a new human form that the hide behind was taking. I assume it was because of the lack of a reaction to the bear form it had previously shown itself as. Like I said earlier, the hide behind wants you to look for it, to come near. Like the angler fish, it dangles something in front of you, attempting to bring you closer. It's a lazy hunter. Tim then continued, I was out in the garage in my workshop, and that feeling came over me again. That being watched feeling. I turn around, and I'm looking out the garage door, but I don't see anything but then out of nowhere I see a lady's head and shoulder pop out from the corner of the garage and the second that she sees me looking at her she pops right back around the corner where she came from well this time I went looking around for her so I had seen crazy people and she looked crazy and I didn't want her grabbing me so I gave a wide berth around that corner and there was no one there. I walked all around the house and I didn't see anyone, not even footprints. Tell me that's not demonic. It wasn't demonic. It was a hide behind and I told the man as such. I told him living out here on the edge of town made him an easy target for it. I told him that there really isn't any way to get rid of them or scare them off. I told him he could try to leave his house for a year at minimum, and maybe, with luck, it will leave on its own, but the best bet would be for him to burn the place down and never come back. He didn't like that answer. My family lived in this house for three generations. I'm not leaving, and I sure as hell ain't burning nothing down. I'll tell you what though, I'm gonna keep my shotgun on me, and when I get that feeling again, I'm gonna shoot it. It works for bears, and that's the meanest thing around these parts. I don't see why it wouldn't work for this, what you call it, hide behind? You can't argue with anyone over the age of 65. People get set in their ways, their beliefs calcify. So instead, I was honest with him. I told him two things. The first thing I told him was that eventually, He'll get that feeling that he was being watched and he'll get his gun and he'll start looking around for the hide behind only he wouldn't find it. That's what happens in all these cases because at that point it found the best hiding spot it can possibly get. The only place you won't be able to lay eyes on it directly behind you and at that point it's too late for you. The second thing I told him was that I'll be back in two days and more than likely he'll be dead. And then that's when I left. Two days later I pulled my van up to Tim's driveway to find the screen door open and blowing in the wind. I didn't even need to cross the threshold of his house to find him. He was everywhere. On the floor the ceiling, the walls, the smell was unbelievable. I poured some gas on the front porch and then I used a match to light it. The house was an inferno within 30 seconds. 
I got in my van and started to pull out of the driveway and I took one last look at the house and then beyond out in the tree line where I saw for just a split second a young boy before he quickly pulled back and disappeared behind a thin little tree. I was hundreds of miles away by lunchtime. I say all of this to you if you ever think you might have a hide behind in your house or even in the area, leave. Burn the place down if you can. So nobody can move into it. These things are like bears. If they know they can get food someplace, they are just going to keep coming back. And if you get the feeling that you're being watched and you can't figure out why, call your loved ones because it's standing directly behind you. If you're reading this, congratulations. I'm most likely dead, or maybe worse. My name is Daniel, and I own quite a bit of land up in the Appalachian Mountains, left to me by my great auntie. So far, in the years I lived here, paranormal and downright disturbing things have happened to me here. People told me to just leave or report it, like I never done that before. To them, I'm just the young guy that went crazy a little too early. It bothers me that normal people have no idea what goes on up here, all alone. You see, my first encounter with them I didn't know how to deal with them. I didn't even know what they were called until recently. It's important, or at least it's important to me that some of the tricks I have learned throughout the three years I lived up here could be of use to somebody one day. My second, or maybe third time I was being stalked by a skinwalker, it felt like I was walking in circles. I had a camera with an SD card pretty deep in the woods. But when I tried to walk back to my cabin, I kept passing the camera. I was walking in circles. This went on for hours. The sun was setting soon, and I was quite thirsty at the time I remember. I sat up against the tree my camera was mounted on, and actually started crying. It was watching me, I guess waiting for me to fall dead. I hit myself in desperation a few times trying to think. I sat up and took a very deep breath, wiped the water from my eyes, and it dawned on me. It's gotta be messing with my equilibrium. I have to be off balance. There's no other way. But I could still walk. But my depth perception was slightly off. All I had to do was tilt my head as far as it would go into my shoulder and walk back to my cabin. My ear was pressed into my shoulder, but even with one ear, I could still hear how anxious the creature sounded, pacing in the woods, hoping I didn't get away. Once I made it inside my cabin, I didn't come out for a couple of days for safe measures. Another trick they know is mimicking animals. I found that they like coyotes. I actually used to hunt coyotes back home, but never up here in the mountains. I seen a couple of my deer cameras that it looked like right after I left my camera. A coyote would follow me a while, if not all the way home. I had to stop that real quick and set out some snares. All a snare would and could do is jam the coyote's legs into the mechanism until a button is pressed and then it could be unlocked. I set out a couple of them but also rubbed some white ash on all the traps. And sure enough, the next time I started walking back from my camera, I hear the sound of one go off. I quickly ran back to where I had laid the traps with a gun drawn, and all that was left was the trap in three separate pieces and the scent of burning hair in the air. Every time I checked the camera after that, a coyote with a nasty burn scar on its leg would stop where the camera was mounted and turn around 
and walk back into the brush. And lastly, do not engage in any type of combat with them. Warding them off is one thing, but actually hunting them is a mistake. I wish I would have known that sooner. I had two buddies back in town I used to tell my stories to. Alcohol loosens the lips. Their names were James and Cole. I'm pretty sure they were cousins, but I never asked. Thinking about it now, I wish I would have gotten to know them better. But long story short, they're dead. And now, I'm dying. This morning, they came and pounded in my door insisting we hunt these skinwalkers. I told them it was a very bad idea, but they even took the liberty of buying silver bullets. They told me how much they cost, but I can't remember right now. I finally caved and we got ready all day. We first started making a large amount of white ash, cleaning our guns, heck, they even packed MREs and special high dollar spotlights. We set off right as the sun went down. We weren't three hours in when disaster struck. We were all sitting around a tree. I could tell that the skinwalkers were watching us. They're all around us, multiple. I'm scanning everything with my spotlight, not even realizing that Cole wasn't with us anymore. I asked James where he was, but he didn't seem nervous at all and told me he may have had to go pee. I turned back to face my front and there I see Cole. He's a good distance out but something wasn't right. He was contorting in ways a human could never. I started to turn around to ask James what we should do, but halfway around, I heard James guttural, sounding, breathing, like his lungs were filling with blood. I couldn't stand to be there anymore and bucked it back to the cabin. The forest seemed like it was laughing at me, in my desperation to run home, I knocked my flashlight running and it was slowly getting dimmer and dimmer. I eventually had to ditch it and use some of the flares that Cole and James brought. I pulled the top off and struck it against the tree and the red flame lit up the surrounding forest. There were so many of them, 10, 20, maybe more, but as luck would have it, they never attacked me. I could see the cabin and flung the door open and shut it behind me. I ran for the upstairs bedroom and quickly got into the old wooden closet where I'm currently typing this. I don't hear them, but they're outside my house. Unfortunately, in the midst of running away, I did end up getting clawed or maybe bit. It's not a terrible wound but it's bleeding black. If you're reading this, if you can, please send help. I really do need it this time. This story comes from Gallup, New Mexico. Family members are inside their home and getting ready for bed. All of a sudden, the dogs outside start raising a ruckus. The man of the family, including an uncle and some nephews, go outside to investigate. Concerned about coyotes getting into the hen house, they think they see something moving about within the trees to the back of the house. The uncle picks up a handful of rocks and throws one after another into the trees. However, they hear or see nothing further outside of the ordinary and so they end up returning to the house with everything normal the night is quiet and the dogs have stopped barking they decide it's safe to go into bed just then they hear a loud rustle from the trees from the limbs whipping and branches snapping they rush back out to the yard all is quiet again for 30 minutes or so they stand guard but not even the wind is blowing. The next morning they go back outside and see that the gate to the hen house as well as the door 
is wide open. All of the birds are gone. The men end up searching the yard and out by the outhouse. They discover, instead, an odd set of tracks going back and forth as if something upon two feet was pacing between there and the trees. Finding no signs of the chickens, they return to the area around the hen house to look for similar tracks, knowing that only one person or someone similar could have opened the gate and the door. But the only marks they find are within the pen and they all belong to chickens. The grandmother, who is standing at the back door of the house, tells them that it was a skinwalker. She says a prayer and together they yell in a loud voice and in Navajo, go away, go bother someone else. It all started when summer came and me and my three friends, Leah, Kathy, and Jennifer were all planning to go camping. Leah asked her dad if he could drop us off and he agreed. When the next day came, we started heading up. Leah's dad had set up the camper that we were using. He told us there were some spare blankets inside in case we got cold. Leah's dad finally got into his truck and turned around. He stopped and rolled down his window and said, No boys, to all of us. He then gave us a smile to let us know he was joking with us and drove off. There was three rooms, one master bedroom and two rooms with bunks. Each room had a TV in it, so nobody cared what room they got. Everyone knew that Jennifer didn't like small rooms, so we ended up letting her have the big room. I was in the room with Leah, and Kathy was in a room by herself. I started unpacking when we heard a loud noise outside. Leah, did you hear that? Hear what? That noise? We both looked at each other, startled, and then continued unpacking. But something seemed off. It was the fact that Leah was so chill about it. I was done unpacking so I walked outside and started a fire. Jennifer walked out and then she asked if I saw it. I responded with, saw what? That's when she started freaking me out. She then started staring at me, but behind me, panicking. Her eyes darted back and forth and then she was calm. I felt as if something was watching me, so I turned around and I saw an orb in the corner of my eye, reddish, black, but by the time I turned around to fully look, it was gone. I was so freaked out because we were in the middle of nowhere, you can say, and it was only the three of us by ourselves. I then told Kathy that she could cook instead. We had her family secret recipe of shepherd's pie and a bunch of vanilla cupcakes. There were about a dozen cupcakes left in the open box, so we just left it on the table and went to bed. I could hear the TV coming from Kathy's room, so I punched the wall and told her to be quiet. Right after I said it, everything went quiet. But then, there was a small scream in the distance. It didn't sound human. It gave me chills that ran down my spine. But I ended up dozing off. But then, I woke up in the middle of the night, hearing noises like if someone was in the kitchen. I wake up Leah, and then we walk out into a small hallway that led into the kitchen. We saw Jennifer sitting on the table, just staring straight ahead. With Kathy being right behind me, we were looking at her, and Jennifer was making weird noises, weird sounds. She was really creeping us out. She never did this or stared into space this often. But then, I noticed something in the corner of my eye. It was a shadow. It was staring at Jennifer. And then it slowly turned to face me and Kathy. I froze. Kathy froze. Then Jennifer looked at us, as if she was being mind controlled. And then this figure, or shadow, ran out the window and Jennifer dropped her head into the table. 
We were trying to wake her up afterwards, but she wouldn't wake up. This experience still scares me to this day, and it is only one of the creepiest things I have ever seen. Me and the others are still very close friends. We even live together now, but we all remember that night and whatever it was that we saw. It turns out that Jennifer remembers seeing it in the daytime, but she says she doesn't remember anything when nighttime came and when we saw it. It freaks us out even more now, knowing that our friend wasn't even awake and staring into space with her eyes wide open. So I want to first say that I don't know much about skinwalkers and other creatures of similar nature. I just now started learning of their potential existence. So now I'm willing to learn and be educated even more on these topics, especially ever since I came across something at night. There's this park my girlfriend and I we used to go to smoke there a lot and we encountered this same dog-like thing multiple times and it was always at night. It looked like a really huge black dog with round bear-like ears and yellowish eyes. The first few times we saw it, we didn't think much of it, but then we noticed that it kept just like spawning in. It never made a sound and it always just stared at us and it would follow us around the park in a creepy way. And just an FYI, we encountered this dog while we were high and while sober on many different occasions. Anyways, we ended up not going to that park no more. But before we stopped going, one of the creepiest things that's ever happened to me happened at that park. We were walking from the parking lot to the park and we would just see this thing emerge from behind a tree and follow us and try to block our path back to the car. Sometimes we had to run and jump a fence just to get away from it. We never had a single dangerous interaction outside of this one time we were at the deepest corner of the park that was bordering a small forest and we had to jump about two fences to avoid that thing. I do have a theory. It could be a stray, but it really did not act like a dog at all. It didn't even feel alive. I felt like it was just actually watching us for some reason, but it was really eerie. My mother is visiting my brother's family, just east of Nevada. My brother and his wife have a night out, and mom's watching over the kids, who are three and five years old at the time. She has just gotten them off to bed and goes into the living room to watch her programs. She nods off in front of the TV and is awakened around 11.30. She says that she hears whistling, not the bored, absent-minded kind but by someone who is really good at it. She finds it strange that someone would be outside at this time of night, not only whistling, but seemingly close to the house. She goes over to the picture window. The moon is bright, the reflection casting a pale glow upon the rooftops of the nearby houses that are on the reservation. When suddenly, dogs from the neighbors saw start barking at once. They sound scared, and they are barking like if it's a warning. Despite the noise, she now hears a different whistle, the kind of police use or sports officials, and it's coming from there by the road which runs along the side of the house. She puts on her robe and goes out to the porch and around to that side of the house. There in the road is this guy who, when he notices her standing there, says that he's the local medicine man. He holds up his whistle like it's some kind of badge. He then tells her there is a skinwalker running through the neighborhood and that she should go back inside and lock the door. My brother finds out the next day from the neighbors that there was a critter of some sort jumping from one roof 
to the next. So anybody listening to this, if you ever hear whistling out at night, don't go outside. If you hear any noises outside your window at night, don't go outside. And whatever you do, don't ever say a word or whistle back. I'll tell you something that is true and real. My grandpa lived in Utah. He always told me stories about skinwalkers and how they could take the form of any animal or anyone that you know. I asked him one day if he had ever met one. He told me that he did a long time ago when he was, and he said, young and foolish. It was long before I was born or even my mother. He explained that he had gone to the valley. He called it Skinwalker Valley. He said it was a valley where nothing living ever ventures out and where even crows, the guardians of death itself, won't go. It's a place of darkness and evil. He told me he went out there one day because he wanted to show others there was nothing to fear. Nothing but city superstition. He said he went out there in his old pickup truck, red in color but faded. When he found the valley, he saw that the grass on the ground and all of the trees were black. He said that the trees were still living though. And not far from where he exited his truck, he said there was a house. It was very old. The roof had fallen in and the door was gone. When he got closer to it, he said he noticed what looked to be deep scratches or claw marks on the side walls. He also described seeing the scattered bones and partial skeletons of animals all over the place as if he had wandered into some sacred burial ground. As he is standing outside the house, he dares not to go in. He hears the voice of his grandmother but she had died sometime prior. Then, there were other voices. They were calling to him, calling for his life, his skin, his blood, and even for his spirit and soul. He knew them to be the voices of the lost, those who could change from man to beast. He quickly ran back to his truck, convinced that he was being pursued every step of the way. Right after that, and for some time to come, he would find possessions of his, even if they were brand new and unused, broken, torn, missing, or even, as was the case with some of the family's animals, dead. It even got to the point where he wouldn't let his dog stay outside at night. And to show me that he wasn't lying, and he made me promise I wouldn't tell my mother, he pulled up his shirt and showed me these deep, and ugly scars along his back. He told me that they were made by the claws of the skinwalker that chased him back to his truck. His only warning to me was to never look a skinwalker in the eye. If you do, it will never forget you and mark you for life. It will have your soul. My grandfather passed away recently. At his ceremony, my uncle laughed in a way that was kind of uncomfortable. Joked that he always thought my grandpa was a skinwalker himself. I'm having a hard time remembering the stories told to me by my Navajo family. But when I Skype with them again, I will ask, This creepy set of events happened directly to me. So here goes. My first personal encounter. It's lengthy, but hey, skinwalkers. They require a backstory. It started when my two brothers, David and Luke, and Luke's girlfriend, Sarah, all drove down to the desert to spend some time in the country. This is a reservation land. 
as it were. So there was red dirt everywhere. Southern Utah, a beautiful place if you ever get a chance. We had some pistols and decided to go out and do some target practice. We took our gear and some old targets to a place called Devil's Heartbeat. I had never been there, but all three of them were familiar with the area. It was a canyon about 200 feet deep. We stayed on one end of the canyon. About 50 feet over, the opposite side of the canyon rose up above us, Anasazi ruins. The Navajo may disagree with historians on the Anasazi's origins and departure. According to Navajo legend, they simply disappeared from existence, leaving behind plates, dishes, and food, and went into another dimension, or some equivalent. But whatever the history, the Navajo do not like to wander in Anasazi ruins. I have never asked why, but I figured it had something to do with disrespect, preserving history, etc. As such, none of the others cared a bit about these canyon ruins. They were more interested in shooting pistols. I could see old beds and even cave drawings on the cliffs with my naked eye, and I got this strange fixation on going over there. I'm not Navajo, and I felt that their rules didn't apply to me. I set off down the cliff without rope and decided I would climb down, cross the canyon floor, and then climb back up. This was a bad idea for a million reasons, but it was somewhat of a obsession. I can't explain the feeling. It was like magnetism. I wanted to be in those ruins, and it wasn't just some tourist-like curiosity. It felt like I was meant to go there. I kept slipping and getting stuck on the rocks, and I was so frustrated, I almost started crying. Finally, I was deterred by the unmistakable sound of a growl coming from the canyon floor below me. There were trees down there, so I couldn't see what was making that noise. A mountain lion immediately rose to mine, and I got my ass back up to the cliffside. I said nothing to the others, and we shot the guns for a while. The only other strange occurrence was while Sarah was aiming, things got really quiet. We all heard a sound from behind us, maybe 20 feet away. It was almost like a growl, then a hoarse laugh, almost like a lion, and then a hyena. We had a clear view of the entire area, and there was nothing there, at least not on the cliff tops where we heard it anyway. The creepy part was that while David, Sarah, and I all heard it from a close distance, Luke heard the exact same noise right by his ear. We ended up camping out there to see if anything would happen. And this is when I got completely terrified. Before, I was only scared of wild animals. Even though we had guns, we were sleeping with no bags or tents. All we had were some blankets under the stars and a little fire. So I felt safe when we all lay down. I fell asleep pretty quickly, but woke up a few hours later to see everyone else laying down with their eyes open wide, listening. The canyon was completely full of noises. The only way to describe it is people banging rocks together. There would be one set, maybe 300 yards away, then another clacking 200 yards away, and then 50 yards away. The canyon echoes, so it was hard to tell exactly how many rock smacking rock noises there was, but they sounded like Morse code. We listened to this for maybe 10 minutes. No other animal noises, nothing. Finally, David, who is kind of a hard ass and the least superstitious of his family, shouted, shut up, and everything 
I mean everything, immediately, stop. My heart was in my throat. We just sat there and stared at each other, wide-eyed. It was dead quiet. And then another super weird noise from the Anasazi ruins. I don't know how to explain this one either, but it sounded kind of like a zebra noise, like these squeakly thrills. It got louder, and then the rocks, sticks, whatever started up again. But this was worse, because now other animal noises came. We heard what sounded like wolves, or coyotes barking, monkeys screeching, owls hooting, and through it all, that terrible zebra noises. We said nope, and got our happy little asses out of there immediately. It took us maybe 10 minutes to douse the fire, pack our blankets, and speed away. And the noises continued that entire time. That night, I was obviously pretty shaken up. Before I could fall asleep again, my Navajo mother came and sat by me. And she said that she could tell I had a rough day. We hadn't mentioned the creepy shit to avoid a lecture about fucking with the spirits. She asked me about it and I ended up spilling my guts about not seeing the canyon ruins. It was something personal, it felt like. I wanted to go there. Why couldn't I go there? It would have been beautiful. After I told her all about it, I could see that she had a really concerned look on her face. What is it? I asked. Totally confused and she explained something I had no idea about. The spirits in the ruins like to draw people up. When they get up on the ground, the spirits push them off. That's why we don't go there. I remain creeped out for the remainder of the visit. Fast forward a few weeks later, I worked at a shitty call center in Salt Lake City, third shift. It was my first night being alone and I was feeling jumpy. My brothers already warned me that I had a skinwalker following me, but I, of course, didn't believe it. I don't smoke, but I follow my co-workers out for smoke breaks because I like to chat. Tonight, I lurked in the doorway because I had this horrible cloud of dread hanging over me. I was peeping out the glass door and being a total weirdo. It hit me then how paranoid I had been, and that's when I remember That's what skinwalkers do. They mess with your mind. While I was pacing in front of the glass door, I decided that this whole thing was fucking stupid and I was gonna go outside and stand there for the rest of my 10 minute break. Most of the smokers were already filling back in, but I walked out and put my hands in my pockets, looked at the sky, looked in the building, mentally patting myself on the back for not being a pussy. Then I saw something that I will never, ever be able to give a rational or even halfway accountable explanation for. We have like six parking lots and one of the lots far away from me, maybe around a hundred feet, I could see something walking. It was a dog, obviously, but it was almost limping and walked like it was tired or hurt. Me being the animal lover, forgot all about skinwalkers and I started walking towards it, making the come here doggy noises. And then I stopped. That's when I saw it. The dog had the body form of a greyhound and it was gray, but there was something very wrong with it. It had bloody legs and it was limping, but it walked more like a person would, on feet and hands. Its butt was moving to and from, if that makes any sense. When it heard me getting close, it just stopped without turning, something I had never known any dog to do. And finally, it looked over its shoulder at me. And this is the freaky part. This dog was looking at me 
the way a person does. It had huge eyes, way too big for a greyhound, and its teeth were barred like it was considering biting me. Then it growled, but it was like a whistle growl, noises no animal makes. It almost sounded like it wanted to talk, or like if it was taunting me. Somehow, in the middle of all this, I realized it didn't have a tail. And I knew and heard from all the Navajo stories that skinwalkers, when they appear as animals, don't have tails. Forgetting all logic and rationality, I turned and took off. I didn't look back until I was back inside the building and had pulled the door shut behind me. And by then, when I looked, of course, the fucking thing was gone. When I described this to my brothers, they were absolutely sure it was a skinwalker. And they went through the trouble of blessing me, my apartment, blessing them and their apartments. I never saw the creepy bloody dog again. And I have never, since even slightly, wanted to visit the cliff ruins. Just to give some background, this happened in the mountains near El Cerro de Tomé. Okay, so Friday, 1.28 a.m., me and my friends decided to go for a drive. We sometimes like to go to the Llano, mountains near El Cerro, to experience something that only happens in that area, paranormal and supernatural. Like any other time we do this, we go in my car and drive past Dalma Hill, going towards the mountains and park across from VHS. Then we sit and take in the scenic beauty of the dark desert. We started by listening close to anything and looking everywhere, being hyper observant. At first, we saw a light in the distance, getting within about a mile away from us, then disappearing altogether. We then decided to move on from there because we had to, and I mean had to see something else. We were driving through roads and flying by at least 30 miles per hour over the speed limit. We then turned down a familiar road. This is the road we knew that something was about to change me and everyone else. It was four of us in total. We looked to the right side of the car, saw what we all believed to be something like a hellhound or maybe a skinwalker. When this massive black dog just launched at my vehicle while I was going 45 through the road, we should have felt impact from this massive creature, but we didn't. We then stopped the vehicle and both people in the back seat looked and saw this thing rise up from the ground. It rose up from the ground and stood straight up on two legs, absolutely huge. It was all black with red eyes that are forever imprinted in our minds. I then slammed on the gas and we sped up to about 55. We took off so fast and as I looked in my rear view mirror, I could see it, huge fucking coyote standing on two legs looking at us as we're driving away. I had only two encounters with a skinwalker, both at our house in Window Rock, Arizona. By the way, we are Navajo. The first encounter was when I was playing around with the PlayStation. My sister and her boyfriend are on the couch. The front door is wide open. There's no screen door. It is nighttime, summer, and hot. I put the game down and feel compelled. I don't know why, but I just walk out onto the porch. At first, I don't notice anything out of the ordinary, but I do feel a bit anxious. As I turn to come back inside, out of the corner of my eye and to the far side of the yard, I see this figure, dark 
against dark, moving across the lawn. I then catch the smell of rotten meat. I call into the house for my sister and her boyfriend. They come outside as well, and the three of us watch as this critter gets up on two feet, strolls into the trees at the edge of the property, and paying us no mind. It then disappears into the dark moments later, and off in the distance, we hear this chanting. It's in Navajo, and it sounds as if it's coming from everywhere at once, and then it just stops. My second encounter happened about two years after the first one. I'm outside in our backyard, in the same property, but it's later in the day, but not quite night. The sun is still out, but it's a bit orange in the sky, and just below the tops of the trees to the west. Way out at the end of the property, where we have these bushes, and just before the woods, I see this figure. It's crouched down and looking at me. Then it just stands, but it's not very tall, not even five feet. At first, I think it's a man, but from what I can tell, it's not wearing any clothes. And if it is naked, it isn't skin and bones, not like any person I have ever seen. But before I could call out or anything else, it turns and lopes off, very awkward with its shoulders rolling from side to side and its arms hanging way too low. This story comes from Gallup, New Mexico. Family members are inside their home and getting ready for bed. All of a sudden, the dogs outside start raising a ruckus. The man of the family, including an uncle and some nephews, go outside to investigate. Concerned about coyotes getting into the hen house, they think they see something moving about within the trees to the back of the house. The uncle picks up a handful of rocks and throws one after another into the trees. However, they hear or see nothing further outside of the ordinary. And so they end up returning to the house. With everything normal, the night is quiet and the dogs have stopped barking. They decide it's safe to go into bed. Just then, they hear a loud rustle from the trees, from the limbs, whipping and branches snapping. They rush back out to the yard. All is quiet again. For 30 minutes or so, they stand guard, but not even the wind is blowing. The next morning, they go back outside and see that the gate to the hen house, as well as the door, is wide open. All of the birds are gone. The men end up searching the yard and out by the outhouse. They discover, instead, an odd set of tracks going back and forth, as if something upon two feet was pacing between there and the trees. Finding no signs of the chickens, they return to the area around the hen house to look for similar tracks, knowing that only one person or someone similar could have opened the gate and the door. But the only marks they find are within the pen and they all belong to chickens. The grandmother, who is standing at the back door of the house, tells them that it was a skinwalker. She says a prayer, and together they yell in a loud voice and in Navajo, Go away, go bother someone else. This event happened just south of Polaca, Arizona, within the Navajo Reservation. A pair of skinwalkers, they say, an old couple that lived deep back in the reservation, were seen lurking around this small cattle ranch. Two heifers had disappeared recently, one of which was discovered down by the creek and mutilated. The man who owned the ranch, his two sons, and his brother armed themselves and went out to try to run them off. 
One of the sons, not yet 18 years of age, was searching out beyond the barn when a dark shape materializing from the darkness itself loomed up in front of him, almost nose to nose. As the boy attempted to raise his rifle, the figure raised its hands up to its face as if it was going to yell something. The boy, trying not to look at it in the eyes, then felt something rush into his face like dust or sand. Even though he tried not to, he ended up taking a breath and some of it was inhaled in. Immediately, things went dark and he started experiencing hallucinations. The others found him only minutes later on his knees, holding the sides of his head and his eyes rolled back. He fell to the ground and went into some sort of trance. His body limped and he became unresponsive. They carried him back to the house and they summoned the local medicine man who came and said some prayers over him but he told the others there was nothing to be done but to wait for the dust traces of which were still on his face and his shirt to wear off. He promised he would come back the next day when the sun was up and blessed the Hogan. Later after he had regained consciousness, the boy swore to the others that he was the victim of a dog-faced creature. He described it as not quite as tall as he is, thin and scraggly, with patches of mangy and dark hair, a canine snout only shorter than a dog's, and with the smell of rotten eggs or worse. He said he doesn't recall anything more before passing out other than not being able to breathe and having no control over his own body.